Hey art nerds! Today we're going to be painting this adorable watercolor illustration to commemorate the one year anniversary of Ink Drop Cafe's launch. So if you want to see how this was made, keep watching! So we're going to be painting this watercolor illustration today. This was printed on 300 pound Kilimanjaro paper. You can still see the blue lines and it's already been penciled. The next step is to go ahead and stretch it, which I'll do off camera. I have plenty of stretching demonstrations here on this channel and over at natosuitdubblogspot.com as part of my watercolor basics series. This image was created to celebrate the one year launch anniversary of Ink Drop Cafe. For those of you who are not familiar, Ink Drop Cafe is a wonderful web comic and comic resource collective. You can find more information and check out our fantastic member comics at inkdropcafe.com. So I'm going to disappear for just a moment and I will return with this illustration already stretched and some of these blue lines magically dissolved. Hey art nerds, we're going to be painting this beautiful promotional piece to help celebrate the one year anniversary of Ink Drop Cafe this week. So I can't wait to share my progress with you guys. Before we jump in too deep, I'd like to take a moment and tell you guys a little bit about Ink Drop Cafe, just in case you don't know. Ink Drop Cafe is a webcomic collective with 13 phenomenal member comics and about four fantastic resources, including this YouTube channel. We have comics that range from fantasy to sci-fi to heartwarming slice of life. And we've got comics for all ages, from your little ones to your adults looking for something a little bit more action packed. Currently, Ink Drop Cafe has comics that cater more to the feminine gaze. So if you enjoy those sort of com comics, if you enjoy comics with um, non-binary or female leads, you should definitely go check out Ink Drop Cafe right now. You can find it at inkdropcafe.com. And if you're an artist looking for resources, be it from tutorials like what I do to uh, promotional opportunities, for your webcomic like Start Fair and Archive Binge, or maybe you're looking for actual assets like what Shooting Stars offers. We have plenty of fantastic resources to help you make your comic and promote your comic. And finally, we have a fantastic webcomic artist discord full of phenomenal artists, both members and non-members. So if you're just looking to make some friends, talk about your comics and their comics, then head on over to our discord and you can find all of the information for all of this at inktropcafe.com. So I have already drawn this really cute illustration of Kara, the main character of my web comic, Seven Inch Kara, which is an all ages watercolor comic, enjoying herself at the Ink Drop Cafe. And you can tell because I've placed our mascot, Squiddy, who's an adorable little squid dude um, on the napkin and on the cup. So I'm painting some of my favorite things today. I'm painting sweets, I'm painting cute things, and I am really excited to go ahead and get started. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and mix up a wash, and I want something warm and inviting. So what I'm gonna end up going for is kind of an orange. And I'm actually, I was gonna grab a little bit of hot pink, but I think instead I'll go for some Holbein Cherry Red. And then I'm gonna use a nice large mop to generously apply it. And it's a nice sort of peachy color, a little light for a skin tone, and I've already stretched my watercolor paper. I am painting today on Kilimanjaro cotton rag watercolor paper, 300 pound cotton rag watercolor paper, and I really like Kilimanjaro watercolor paper. It's Cheap Joe's store brand. I feel that it performs just really, really well. I like how it handles for my sort of illustration-y, illustrative style. So I highly recommend if you haven't checked out Kilimanjaro, you do so. All right, next step is to prop this puppy up so it dries at a little bit of an angle. 
This might be a little much. And if there's any sort of dripping, I'm going to want to kind of sop that up just so that we don't have a higher concentration in one area than another. And actually propping this up is better for the camera. You guys can actually kind of see what I'm doing a little bit better. So now that this is dried, I actually want to do just a little bit of sort of a gray blue color in the background, just enough to knock it back into the background. So I've got my Daisy palette just out of sight and I'm going to mix that up and apply that using a soft squirrel hair brush. I've had some problems with Winsor Newton neutral tint. Uh, lifting and remixing. I'm using it, but I'm a little hesitant about it. Hopefully I won't regret this. Now I can do this a couple ways. I can apply it and then apply water and have it blend down and just kind of work around Kara's face and she's in the foreground and having that go into her face would kind of knock her face back into the background. Or I can just keep it in the background or I can kind of do a combination of both. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start applying it and let that dry and then I can always do another layer and see what I think. So as you guys can see, I worked around Kara and I worked around the cake and I think that was a really good decision because it really helps knock the stuff in the foreground behind the stuff in, I mean, the stuff in the background behind the stuff in the foreground. So we've got a darker, cooler shade in the background and our warmer glaze kind of helps pull this forward. So I think I might even just skip doing the, the blend. Clean that up just a little bit. And, um, Actually on camera, it isn't even noticeable. In real life, it's a little bit more noticeable, but something I wanna point out is that because watercolor dries lighter than it goes down, um, it's gonna be a lot less noticeable, but it's gonna be enough just to kind of give that impression. And um, also after I've added all the colors, it really won't be noticeable at all. Um, all right, so I've propped this up a little bit with a power bank. Use what you got, and I'm gonna let it dry. All right, so our background has had a chance to dry, and this is the same cafe as my first Ink Drop Cafe promo image, which you guys can see right here. So I want to replicate the white marble countertop that I have in the first one. So I'm mixing up some urban blue violent because I really like using that as sort of a base tone for whites. And then I'm also activating black, neutral tint, Payne's gray, indigo blue, and all of those sort of quieter gray tones. Ooh, this could be kind of a challenge on this one. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna have to work in stages. So I'm using the really light wash of Urban Blue Violet. And I have to dual wield my brushes here also. So I'm gonna grab some Payne's Gray. Um, I need to decide which way I kind of want the grain of the table to be. And then I just kind of float in my gray while it's still wet. And then I'm gonna grab a little bit of black
and sort of float that in as well. And this paper is handling a lot differently than the Moulin de Roy I used initially. Every watercolor paper has its quirks. That was just a technique I had never tried on the Kilimanjaro. Do it down here as well. And it doesn't have to be identical either to the original Ink Drop promotional painting. It just needs to be reminiscent of I mean, if it was identical, then y'all would assume she's sitting at the same table she was sweeping sugar from. Now I'm gonna work over here. And this has really just been such a year of growth because we went from pretty much ground zero, the ashes of another, another collective to like 14 members. And we're talking about opening up recruitment. And then we went from, gosh, like four resources and then a couple of members started new resources in the year so we were able to grow in that regard which is really exciting for me because that's the big selling point to me is a collective that has art resources and it does seem like other collectives are kind of joining in on that which is great right the more support for art resources the merrier because we really don't get a lot of recognition we get kind of taken for granted And I am just really excited. Oh, that table looks so weird to me. It did not turn out the way I wanted it to, but that is okay. We're going to roll with it, see how it dries. But I'm really excited and hopeful that this upcoming year, we're going to grow even more. And growth takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of energy. It takes time and it takes commitment. So... Even though I'm a founder, I need to be patient and appreciative of the growth we do manage and try not to get discouraged. That's always been my problem is I've always had like these big dreams and just not enough patience for reality to kind of catch up. So that's something I definitely need to work on this year. And just continue to try and be a resource as one of the founders. And try to be encouraging. So it's been an opportunity for growth for me, for sure. I usually work alone on my projects, or if I do collaborate, I, I mean, because I've done anthologies and I've organized small anthologies, that sort of thing. But it's usually a very small group of people who are all kind of in a local proximity and I'm not really asking a lot of them. So this has definitely been a growth opportunity for me, especially because a lot of my leadership opportunities have been as a teacher where teaching people is very different from sort of leading a collaborative effort that should have benefits for all of the participants. Because when you're a teacher, you just, even if they don't listen, you can get away with just being like, ah, you're gonna do this because I said you should do this and because it's for your best and I know better. I know that's really, that's really reductive of teaching, but when you're dealing with or working in a leadership or management capacity in a group, 
of peers, you just really have to change how you manage people and how you talk to people. Have to really focus on respect, and building respect, being respectful, being encouraging of other people. Being there for them and celebrating their victories, acknowledging their victories. So. I think it's been a good growth opportunity for this young self-employed person who works from home. I'm gonna let the table dry. I'm not super satisfied with it. It kind of moved differently than I expected it to, moved differently than the other paper did. But I'm gonna roll with it. This is what I got. This is what I'm gonna work with. So that first layer is dry. I'm gonna go back into the Urban Blue Violet and use that to go ahead and add shadows. And hopefully that won't reactivate anything too, too much. And also hopefully give me kind of an opportunity to correct some of these errors I made when I was trying to cover the area, but I wasn't really getting in tight enough. Let me see if I can zoom in. Not as much as I'd like. Oh, the blue's doing weird things. That's okay. Every watercolor illustration is a journey and some of them are just a little bit more tedious than others. So in some of my vlogs, I've talked about really struggling with anxiety and depression and kind of finding a place to belong. And one of the things Ink Drop Cafe has been able to do for me as, to be fair, as a member and as an affiliate, is that it's given me kind of a place to be. I work from home, so I don't necessarily get a lot of social interaction during the week. I get a bunch of it at conventions, sometimes too much and I get overstimulated, but it's kind of feast or famine. I'm either completely inundated with people and dealing with their needs, or I'm completely sequestered away. And the only people I talk to are like the people at Starbucks if I decide to go walk over there. Oh, I missed this area completely. Also live in kind of the college part of Nashville and Nashville has like 32 colleges. So, you know, there's a lot of college parts of Nashville, but as somebody who isn't college age and um, isn't attending college anymore, it's really hard. I, I, can't, I don't really connect with those people in a college setting, right? Like I don't belong there. So I, do have some friends here in Nashville. I don't have a lot of friends in Nashville and I don't have very many comic creator friends in Nashville. In fact, most of my comic creator friends are online. So being in the Ink Drop Cafe Discord, it gives me other people to talk to about common comic people problems or comic common illustrator people problems. So that's also been really nice and it's been really helpful for how I deal with my depression because I don't feel as alone anymore. And then also having other comic artists who, um, I don't know, it kind of holds me accountable or I feel more accountable to make sure my projects take a higher priority in my life. Because last year and the year before with conventions and honestly with founding a drop cafe, my own work got really badly backburnered and it set me really off track and I just really didn't get the things done last year and the year before that I really wanted to and I planned on getting done. But now that things are kind of stable and settled, at least with Ink Drop, I can kind of go back to focusing on my things again. So it's, it's nice to kind of have um, an environment where I feel encouraged, I guess, to work or inspired to work motivated would be the best word and i know there are other comic collectives out there so i don't mean to make it sound like ink drop is like the only one it's just the one that i'm part of and the one that i helped found so 
it's it's really nice to like be able to make a community thing to kind of serve some of the needs that everyone in the community has. And I hope more people feel inspired to do that instead of turning to like existing collectives to kind of be a home for them and to solve their problems, to feel confident in maybe forming a collective with their friends and kind of having each other's back. Cause that's kind of the point of a webcomic collective when you get really down to it is um, everybody needs promotion. Everybody needs encouragement. Everybody needs maybe a common buddy or someone who's been there before you that you can kind of learn from their mistakes so you don't have to make the same mistakes. And having a collective of friends where you share information and you share resources and you share experiences and you don't have to worry about like, like a lot of comic people are kind of, and I personally feel like they're unnecessarily worried about this, but they're kind of worried about rocking the boat. Like with printers, like if a printer has done a terrible job, they sometimes don't even want to say anything because they're so afraid of like making enemies, which is kind of ridiculous because you're paying for a service. But in a collective, you can talk about those things and you shouldn't have to worry about somebody like, I don't know, writing an email to that publisher and, or printer and being like, hey, so-and-so said all this stuff about you, right? Like it's, even if you're not friends with the people in your collective, they should be people you trust. And in comics, especially web comics, which is often very lonely and people kind of working from home and working in their down hours and working at their own pace, like it's really nice to have kind of a designated place for that information. Like being in a guild, I guess. Like you're not always best friends with everybody in your guild, but for the most part you like them and you trust them and you feel like they care about your well-being, right? Because it benefits the whole to care about the well-being of any individual member. Okay, just kind of noodling with the marble. It doesn't look as good as the first marble, which is bugging me, but I need to get to the point where I can just let it go. And ideally in a collective, it shouldn't be so big that the things you do just completely go unnoticed every single time. Um, it should be small enough that everyone can kind of get some recognition for their accomplishments. And I feel like 13 people plus an open discord is a pretty good number for that. Pretty good number to make sure people get their needs met. All right, I'm gonna let this dry. So one of the things I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to get the table kind of as finished as possible. And the reason I'm doing that is because I, there's a very good chance that as I'm adding other colors, they will leach into the table if I tried to add like table glazes, basically. I just totally botched that explanation. Basically trying to get the tabletop finished because this is the best time to do that. Unfortunately, working any one area kind of to completion, at least for me, it kind of throws off my ability to work on the whole or to judge the whole So it's not necessarily a technique I recommend. I generally suggest you work on the piece kind of in stages together. I'm a big fan of batching things. But sort of just given this tabletop has kind of a lot of detail. there's a lot that can just kind of go wrong with it as well. But I think I'm going to add this shadow layer and then probably call it quits on the table. Just because it isn't an area of focus, I don't want to overwork it. I don't want it to have more detail than any of the other items. In fact, I want it to kind of have less detail because it's not important. You know, kind of 
smooth out some of the hard edges. And another reason I'm kind of finishing the table up is if I finish up this table surface, I can go clean off my daisy palette, have it completely fresh, have all my wells clear for the rest of the image. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I wanna work on starting the glass in the parfait glass and in the glass case. So I'm gonna grab some Payne's Gray. This is something you kinda work on in stages. And I'm going to go ahead, leaving a bit of a reflection. I'm not sure if you guys can see that. I apologize if not. And I'm going to do the same thing down here. And it is a shame that I am so dang low energy. I sound, I know I sound like really unenthusiastic. Um, I have been sick, really sick for like the past two weeks. But celebrating the anniversary is really important to me. This is a milestone that all of us in Ink Drop have worked really hard for. And uh, it was kind of a priority to make sure, at least for me, it was a priority to make sure something was done to celebrate it. So I apologize if me sounding kind of downbeat imply, I don't know, implies anything because it just implies to me that I'm sick. <laughs> I also couldn't put off working on it anymore though because I really, really wanted to have this for the 29th. And it is currently the 24th. So I gave myself as much time as I could to recover and now it's time I got to get back on the horse. So I am using Payne's Gray to kind of block in the glass on both the display case and in the parfait jar. And I'm going to spend more time detailing the parfait jar than I am the display glass because the display glass is in the background. And next I am, so Ink Drop's colors are teal and kind of a darker blue. I'm gonna go ahead and mix up that teal. Now in the first image I did, she's wearing a teal dress like it's a uniform, but today Kara gets to celebrate. She is not working. So I am going to make the plates teal. Normally I would go with white, but I think I'll do the plates teal. Hmm, maybe I want to do the napkin, kind of a teal color. So I'm activating some blue greens and some green blues. Because those make the best teals. So I kind of want to have her drinking maybe hot cocoa since so many of our participants really seem to love hot cocoa. I mean, who doesn't love hot cocoa, right? But just like as like a little nod to our chatters. So I'm gonna make the napkin. Start with this. A pale blue green. And I also started kind of marking in some reflected color on the cup and on the bottom of the spoon. I also think I want to do a little bit on the inside of the spoon as well. All right, 
since the napkin has dried, I'm going to go ahead and add some shadows and detail to it. All right, and then I'll let the napkin dry. All right, now that the napkin has had a chance to dry, I wanna apply some color to the plate and to the cup. And I'm gonna do that by grabbing a little bit of the Urban Blue Violet. I'm actually gonna work much lighter this time and just a little bit of Payne's Gray. And this works really well as a nice base color. And I'm trying to also leave the white of the paper. Though I guess it's not even really the white of the paper because I went ahead and toned it first thing. So I want to go ahead and leave a little bit of the almost white of the paper. I think that's gonna be a good match. While that dries, I'm gonna grab some yellow ochre and some scarlet and start mixing up Kara's skin tone. I'm sort of saving her dress for a little bit later on until I have more colors on the page established because I just, the, the background is kind of more important than what she's wearing, if that makes sense. So I want to make sure I select something that works well with the picture. Since she, although she is the focus, her dress is not the focus. So, since the white layer, I say white in quotations, the white layer on the cup is dry enough. I'm gonna go ahead and start doing skin tone on Kara here. And really my goal at this point is just to start getting things kind of blocked in so I can get a good idea sort of what my overall color palette's gonna look like, where I need to add color, what colors I can use, what colors will be kind of distracting, that sort of thing. Now that our skin has dried, I am going to go back in on the plates. Just kind of do another layer of shadow. Then 
I need to start thinking about what I'm gonna put over here. So this is a piece of chocolate cake. This is gonna be a nice bright red strawberry. I'm sort of thinking I should make the contents of this parfait glass, like strawberry vanilla kind of thing. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of brown since vanilla has kind of a warm cast to it. In fact, I kind of grabbed the wrong brown. I wanted a nice warm brown and that I got a desaturated brown. So I'm just gonna clear out that well and refill it. If you don't like a color you mix, you don't have to be committed to it. You can always clean it out and start fresh. Grab. That's better. Now that you guys can see it, so you're just gonna have to trust me that it's better. And then a little bit of alizarin crimson, since strawberry flavored things tend to be kind of a pastel-y pink. And then the think about where the glass is thick and where it's thin, because that's going to affect how we paint our delicious parfait. And then I'll do a little bit of vanilla. Might even get brave and do like a strawberry swirl after. And add a little bit of pink up at the top there. But that glass is looking pretty good so far, so I'm pretty satisfied with that. Now that the strawberry has had a little bit of time to dry, I'm gonna go in using the same color I initially mixed. And I'm only doing this in the thin parts of the glass. Then I'm gonna grab a little bit more of my two mixing colors, alizarin crimson and cherry red. And I'm kind of flooding the area, which is not what I want to do. So I'm going to do a little bit more of a direct mix. Then I'm going to grab some more of the vanilla color to sort of blend that out. Hopefully, when this is finished, it won't look like blood in the glass. It'll look like a strawberry milkshake. I'm also gonna grab just a little bit of Payne's Gray. Mix it with some of the original white shadow we'd originally mixed up. Just start tightening up some areas. Now I didn't mix this in with the original mix because I didn't want to lose that original mix. Just want the option to be able to add just a little bit of shadow here and there. I might have messed that up by doing the interior of the handle. Go in, start defining this cup a little bit more. looking pretty good. I want to do the same thing on the plate over here. And that's a 
little darker than what I wanted. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of blend it out. I think we're looking pretty good. Maybe a bit of that darker color. And then give things kind of a chance to dry. All right, so our cup and our plate are drying. I think it's probably time to put a little bit more mileage on the glass in the background, and it is definitely time to paint the spoon. So it strikes me that there's gonna be a lot of neutrals in this piece. So, especially with like the brown of the cake. So maybe dressing Kara in red, like the strawberry would be kind of like a nice sort of trifecta of color, I guess, something like that. It's a nice bright color that would help kind of unify the piece. It would also not look like she's wearing the Ink Drop Cafe uniform, which she was intentionally wearing in the first illustration. So I don't necessarily want to revisit that. And uh, I think it would really help her pop. So red is a really strong color. And when you're watercoloring with red, it kind of has a tendency to bleed and go all over the place. So I am probably going to wait until nearish the end to start working on her dress, or at least until more of her and her surrounding area are completed. But I can definitely go in to the spoon And I should have left the white highlight alone. Okay, then I'm gonna grab some more concentrated Payne's Gray. Hopefully not too much. I'm gonna kind of drop it into the bowl of the spoon here so we get some really nice diffused color. I think that's gonna work really well. And then maybe a little bit back here on the handle. Honestly, I can probably even use the color I mixed up for the milkshake as Kara's main dress color. And speaking of said milkshake, I'll just drop a little extra red in there. And then hopefully I can leave well enough alone. A little red in there also, and down there, just sort of like it's reflecting what's in the glass. Switch over, not to a smaller brush, hmm, maybe to a smaller brush. I was gonna say to one with a better point and I'm looking at my collection of brushes and I'm a little disappointed by what I picked. So, just had to roll with it. Anyway, go ahead and kind of block in her neck as being in shadow. And sometimes I use this technique, I don't know, it helps me keep my shadows more consistent and it also helps me have better contrast on things like skin tones that I tend to overly blend out. And on her leg. And we're gonna let those dry before we progress with the skin tones. So, remind me guys, red on the dress. Maybe even polka dots, wouldn't that be really cute? Like a little polka dot dress. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do my first layer on this strawberry over here. And I'm using the same color as we use for the strawberry milkshake as kind of my base color. And I'm also leaving a white highlight. And I'm grabbing a piece of paper towel here just to try and sop up some of the excess.
And that'll be kind of a good base color. We're gonna go a lot darker than that. That's kind of a nice base. Also, I'm going to start mixing up my base chocolate color and activating those half pants. And I like doing really warm, rich, chocolatey colors that rely pretty heavily on like Van Dyke brown. There's something about a warm brown for a chocolate that's just much more inviting in my opinion than like a desaturated brown. And while that goes ahead and kind of permeates into my pan, start painting Kara. I think I can actually zoom in for you guys on this one. So in other painting tutorials, we talked about doing kind of the domino mask since for most people, their eyes are kind of recessed into their faces. It's always kind of a good starting point. And then since she's looking up, I'm going to want to have the upturned part of her face a little more brightly lit. Yeah, right now I'm getting really good contrast, which is a shame because this is gonna dry lighter. So I'm gonna lose a lot of that. I may have to, in fact, mix the color a little bit darker. And we're gonna go back over the areas that we kind of previously colored. We did that stage just to kind of make sure we had enough contrast and we're able to get enough, enough depth. Sometimes when I'm doing stage by stage, layer by layer, I forget to like kind of knock in my contrast early on. So this is a good way for me to remember. Now I'm gonna start mixing up. Actually, I wanna switch brushes because I don't wanna, I'm using a Series 7. I really don't wanna wreck that. So get something a little more disposable to start mixing our brown. And I want it to be kind of light because I'm going to want to be able to go darker. I'm gonna start. Oh yeah, that's gonna be like a good starting color for the hot chocolate. Cause it's really light and almost hazelnut in color. I also wanna clean up that edge. That's the worst part about painting when sick is that to be like double careful about your fine motor control because it kind of goes out the window. Okay, so I'm gonna give this a chance to dry. All right, so before I get too, too much further, I know you think I'm gonna like work on the background. No, it's not what I was gonna say. I'm going to work a little bit more on the napkin, just kind of add some shadows here and there. I've got some dry brush going on. I'm totally cool with that. To be honest, I love the look of dry brush and how it kind of sparkles on the paper. But then I have this propensity to like over blend everything. So I tend to lose a lot of that. Right now, if I'm being really honest, this piece is really bothering me. It just feels kind of messy. It's too loose. I definitely feel like I'm in ugly stage category. 
Now, for those of you who don't know what the ugly stage is, it doesn't matter if other people think it's ugly. It is that stage in your mind where your brain has decided it doesn't quite look like what it had in mind and it's in your mind's mind and it's like hitting the abandoned ship abort mission buttons and you know I'm gonna ignore it some of my favorite pieces have come from me ignoring that my brain tends to hit that button a little too hard and a little too early because I'm kind of a risk averse person so it like like wants to abandon ship quick I'm just gonna roll with it though I'm gonna keep painting especially because I am really excited about having an illustration for our anniversary that is super important to me I want to do everything I can to celebrate our anniversary and let people know about Ink Drop Cafe and get people to come check out our work. And this is one of the ways to do that. And I'm telling you guys all this because I know a lot of you probably struggle with the ugly phase and pushing through. And even if the piece doesn't look as good as you imagined, or even if you can't salvage it and it's just, a, just like a legitimately not good watercolor illustration, you're still gonna learn a lot by pushing through so I really recommend pushing through the ugly phase, using it as a learning app opportunity if you absolutely cannot salvage it. I want to make it look like there's like a little bit of like white foam action kind of going on, if you guys know what I mean. I think that'll work. I'm glad kind of took a time took the time to kind of darken some areas on the the I want to keep saying one I keep wanting to say paper towel napkin it's a napkin Becca and I'm gonna need to start thinking about the background but what I'm actually going to do is I'm gonna wait until the piece is much further progressed and then I'll start thinking about the background um, since the foreground is really what's important I'm going to go ahead and go into our spoon. Use some brush strokes that hopefully better define the shape. that's pretty good there and I don't want to get too tight this is not the right brush for it and I just want to remove these clips because they kind of get in the way but I think that's a pretty good place to kind of leave it cheat a little bit mad little bit of very concentrated Payne's gray there. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to add a little bit of shadow to Kara's eyes is just gonna kind of help. And a little bit to her teeth as well. It's one of those things that the longer you wait, the harder it gets to do. So it kind of pays off to do it early. And then taking our strawberry color. There we go. Also, I want to do the first layer on Kara's dress. And we said red. So what I wanna do first first is I'm gonna to wanna to do 
some shadow because I think a red and white dress would look really cute. So, gotta think about areas that wouldn't be stark white. I'm going to have to clean up this area over here because it really kind of bled into what ended up being white. And then I'm trying to decide what I want to do with that waistband. I think I want that waistband to be white. So she's kind of wearing a white and red outfit. I'm going to continue my quest of mixing my chocolate color darker. So Van Dyke Brown, some sepia. I want darker and more saturated because I'm going to start filling in the foreground cake. And I don't know about you guys, but chocolate cake is my favorite cake. So that's what I'm going to be painting. So a while back, I shared a tutorial for printing blue lines. This illustration had the blue lines printed first. And when I print blue lines, that's something I drew either in my sketchbook or on my computer. And I drew it quote unquote by hand. So I didn't use any sort of tracing, um, photographs, anything like that. And I mostly drew it from my imagination. I might've used some photographs for reference but it's my characters, the settings come from my head, that sort of thing, right? And this woman left a comment that uh, she basically said what I was doing was cheating. And I'm thinking about that now because it's like, <laughs> it does take you a lot of work. And for, and this isn't even one of the more complicated illustrations I've done. Um, I do watercolor comic pages after all. It's an end to, or a means to an end. It is my art from start to finish and uh, you know, whatever helps you get the illustration done is valid and legitimate. I just thought it was funny because it was like, you probably paint using photographs as reference. I don't understand why you think that is any less cheating than this is. And I don't consider either cheating for the record. I have a lot of respect for more traditional watercolor artists who paint more traditional themes. Um, I enjoy watching videos where people cover those sort of techniques. And on occasion, I practice those sort of techniques myself. But that's not my bread and butter, and that's not where the majority of my income comes from. So I've had to find techniques that allow me to accomplish what I want to accomplish. In a reasonable time frame with reasonable energy and expenses. So I'm all for methods that allow people to create the sort of art they want to create. The world needs more art. The world needs more artists. The world needs more people taking a risk and creating beautiful things and ugly things and things that didn't quite make it and all, you know, the whole gamut of creativity. And I think it's kind of funny that somebody has like strong opinions about that. It's like, maybe you should try it. You might actually really like it. So I'm grabbing some more blue green. I'm going to mix that in with my original teal and hopefully it won't be too blue. I'm going to go in on the napkin again. To be honest, I always have trouble using beautiful bright colors in the sort of illustration style I have. They sometimes can be a little, <clears throat> a little more than I can personally handle well. So it's something I'm still learning how to do, still working on doing. I'm 
or maybe the trick is to develop a style that suits the bright colors. Maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. Is that this particular painting style just doesn't really work very well for it. I don't know. I'm still fairly young, so I've got decades to figure it out. I'm excited to learn and grow, but I'm not going to stress out about it. Although this seems to be this seems to be working okay, so that's good. I'm gonna end up overworking that stupid napkin. So I better, I better halt what I'm doing and let things dry, let things chill. I say that and then I'm like, oh, but I can work on the, on the sleeves again. So something that's kind of interesting to me about Ink Drop Cafe, since we're working on a anniversary illustration that as of right now, I am the only person in that collective who works primarily traditionally, which it's been a really interesting learning and growing experience for me because uh, web comics has been really kind of a hard transition. Um, it hasn't been my favorite life choice and uh, being in a group with other webcomic artists has kind of given me an opportunity to try new things, see how other people do things and learn. Especially since so many of them work digitally and when I was at SCAD they were still kind of pushing traditional media, like traditional inking techniques and that sort of thing. They weren't opposed to you doing things digitally but we it really wasn't impressed upon us that that was a skill set we would need i know that sounds ridiculous now and not even that much time has passed so um i'm really kind of behind the curve in a lot of ways when it comes to like comics for digital production comics for digital consumption so being in a collective with people who have like their whole focus for comics has been completely web centric the entire time it's just been a really good opportunity for me to learn things that I would not have otherwise had the opportunity to learn because I wouldn't have been around people who had those skill sets or even cared about those skill sets. And um, I think a couple of us really are very, are more print focused but that's not even the majority's goal. So that's also interesting because I've always been very print focused. And by that I mean printing your comic work, not selling prints at conventions necessarily. So it's just always cool to be able to hang out with people who want things that are different from what you want or have skill sets that differ from your skill set. And sometimes it can be kind of uncomfortable because you feel like you're a fish out of water or sometimes you're like, well, I don't really know why I'm even here. I don't have anything to contribute kind of feelings. But I think those kind of feelings can be really important for personal growth. So it was important to me to kind of stick that out. All right, let this dry as well. All right, we finally get to start putting some red on the dress. And really, it's going to start as pink because I'm going to build it up. And I also noticed how just kind of like dark and kind of sad the color palette for this is. 
And part of the reason it went in that direction is I went way overboard trying to do the marbling effects on the white marble. So I'm gonna have to figure something to kind of salvage that because that is not my intention. But I also don't want to add a bunch of bright stuff to the background because that's just going to steal the focus from the foreground. So that's not a good solution either. Oh, switch brushes, that one is somewhat dull. And then give that a chance to dry. All right, guys. So previously, I've expressed some disappointment with how this piece is turning out. So I'm going to show you guys an exercise that I find really helpful for sort of reclaiming a piece that maybe isn't working that well. And for this exercise, we're going to need any kind of scrap paper. I'm going to use post-its because I'm going to put them on the side. And we're going to need a pen. And I'm not going to write this on camera just because I don't want to write on top of my piece. So what do I not like about this piece? It feels kind of dark, right? Actually, maybe I can, yeah. Okay, why? Realistically, why? The individual elements, they're okay, but that table is really dark. So the table being as dark as it is kind of makes the piece feel moody and downbeat. Okay, well, can we do anything about that right now? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe we could apply, because this is cotton rag watercolor paper, we could apply a lot of water to certain areas and try to lift them up, especially the darker areas like that. So we do have something to lose by doing that. Uh, we have a lot to lose by doing that, but uh, you, never, you never soar if you don't take some risks, right? You never fly if you never take a leap. So. I've got a paper towel here. I'm gonna want a clean cup of water and my goal isn't to scrub it out. My goal is to lift it out. So I'm gonna go grab a cup of clean water and be right back. All right, so we've got our clean water, we've got our paper towel handy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a brush and kind of reactivate those areas. Give it just a chance to soak in. Reactivate that paint. And then I'm going to use my paper towel. And it did lift some. It didn't lift a lot, but it did lift some. So I'm gonna try that again. Also going to try that over here. I have less faith that it'll work over here. Now you could also try scrubbing it a little bit, but I don't wanna damage the surface of the paper too much. All right, it also lifted a little bit. And honestly, anything we can do that doesn't involve making, like applying paint to make corrections to something like this is a step in the right direction. So even if we're not lifting a lot, the fact that we're lifting anything at all is going to help. Okay, so we've got this area here. Um, I think I could probably get a little more up. And also keep in mind that paint gets lighter. Oh, snap. That was not good. I don't know if you guys saw that, but I basically flicked my paint palette because I applied pressure to this. 
So I ruined some of my colors. It's a hard knock life, y'all. Clean that up. But I'm gonna get right back to doing this and I'll finish cleaning that up in a minute. This area over here is too dark. All of this is too dark. This over here is too dark. And this is still too dark. And this is still too dark. My plan B for this is to apply some watercolor pencil on top of some of these areas and just visually lighten it up since I'm not going to be able to get the paint up quite as much as I want to. It makes me a little nervous to do it that way because it's so late in the game it makes it hard for me to gauge my colors. successful in at least getting some of the paint up and like I said earlier anything is better than nothing so I'm gonna let this dry and clean up the mess I made all right so we did a little bit of correction I remixed some of my colors I'm still not a hundred percent about it so what I'm going to go do is I'm actually gonna go take a break I'm gonna step away from this give myself an hour um, and hopefully come back to it with fresh eyes and kind of reassess. And these are important things to practice, especially if you're going through the ugly stage, because we can make some really rash decisions when our painting's in the ugly stage. We could do some terrible, terrible things that we just can't take back. So it's better to give yourself a break, to take a few minutes, and then if you still feel that way, to sit down and think critically about why you feel that way, even if you have to make notes, which is something that I do. And that way it's there. I think I can think about how to solve it, but it doesn't have to be at the top of my brain. So as always, I lie when I say I'm taking a break. However, I'm not touching the majority of the painting. I am just going to go in and add some green to the leaves and that's something I would be doing regardless. I also, off camera, nitpicked the spoon a little bit and uh, kind of added another layer of wet into wet color which I think actually really works. Metal is usually a challenge for me. And for some reason, spoons and forks, because just given their shape, they're a little hard for me to draw. So I'm actually really pleased that I'm actually able to kind of convey a spoon really well. Level up. All right, that's one leaf. I have to get some stiffer brushes. Kilimanjaro kind of has a mind of its own. So for detail work, floppy, soft squirrel hair brushes don't really cut it. And it makes it harder to do tight details, which kind of contributes to like an overall sloppy look in this sort of an illustration. And I'm gonna grab a little bit of Van Dyke Brown. I'm going to have to clean up that edge using a 
permanent white, like bleed proof white. But I think that cocoa is looking pretty good. And then once that's dried, I'm gonna start working more on the cake itself. So this has had a chance to dry for a little while. Um, earlier, I had remixed the red since I'd kind of ruined my original mix. I'm going to go ahead and move my post-it note. That is still important information and I do still want it available, but I'm gonna move it for now. Go ahead and kind of test out how this color looks. I think it'll be a good match, but I am dissatisfied with how floppy that brush is. So I'm gonna grab hopefully this one will be a little bit better. Because I want to leave room for highlights and color variation. Because I want this to look like a satin ribbon. Or at least be reminiscent if I can't capture it perfectly. Although I don't have any desire to be a photorealistic painter, there are some things, some areas I really try to improve in. And I think improving my ability to render texture would be really helpful. So that's an area I'd like to dev devote time and study to. And not just recreating texture from reference, because I can do that, but actually stylizing textures and committing them to memory so that I can pull them out whenever I'm working on a comic page. So to do that, I'm gonna need to work on doing style tests and studies from reference because that's how you develop a style, is you draw something over and over again, you see how other people draw it, you think about it critically, you break it down into the individual components. I don't have a particularly good visual memory. My visual memory is pretty, pretty sad for someone who works in the arts as a profession. So I have to work a little bit harder to remember those things, to commit those things to memory. And that means finding the time and dedicating the time to actually studying it. So if that's something you need to do, there's absolutely no shame in that. We can be practicing it together. All right, I do like the darker red. I'm still kind of disappointed by how dark the table is. It's still darker than I would have liked. I'm gonna grab some undersea green and mix it with a little bit of indigo. just kind of do my immediate shadow for the spoon I think that's gonna help and then here where the napkin has kind of turned away from the light here too where the cup casts a shadow blend that out a little bit Go over to this side. Do the same thing. Hmm, I think that's gonna work. I'm gonna have a lot of cleanup to do on this piece since I'm working while sick and that's never, 
never an ideal situation, but just the fact that I'm able to work and able to solve some of these problems is really nice. So I'm gonna grab a nice warm lighter brown because I wanna do the inside of the cake box as well as the outside. And something I'm gonna do kind of before that is I'm gonna go ahead and apply kind of a muted blue gray to the background because it's easier to do it now than it will be after I've painted that brown. And that's just going to make the brown look like it's a little bit more in shadow, a little bit receding into the distance. And I'm even painting over those uh, highlights. It's okay, hopefully when I dr this dries, I will have a It's also important at this stage not to get too caught up in details, which is sometimes hard for me. I forget that because I wanna clean things up. I wanna get a glimpse of the final piece. And details are how we do that. But details too early on can also turn muddy or kind of distract us from So using this as an opportunity to add a little bit of detail to the parfait glass. Not too much, like I said, we're not trying to get this finished rendering. We're not trying to finish rendering this, but just some necessary detail. And then I'll go into her sleeves and add a little more shadow. And I actually want to mix my shadow for her sleeves and the other white parts of her dress, a little bit darker. So I'm gonna grab a little more Urban Blue Violet and then a little bit more Payne's Gray. Kind of give this opportunity Dry. I say that and then I immediately go into the chocolate for the cake. So we want a spongy cakey texture. Don't know if I can get this where you guys can see it. I apologize. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in the side that is away from the light source that isn't receiving direct light. Then I'm gonna put a drop shadow in where the icing would be occluding some of the light. I'm gonna let both of those dry and then I'm gonna start working on my cake texture, which is really easy to do. It's actually one of the reasons I really like painting sweets is textures for sweets are just easy. Maybe I eat too many sweets. Maybe that's the problem or the, the benefit. I don't know. So we're gonna let this dry and then check back in in a few minutes. All right, so our first layer has had a chance to dry. I say first layer, it's not, a, I'm talking specifically about the strawberry really. Get in there, do another layer, make a delicious looking strawberry. And then I'm gonna get into this display case here. And hopefully you guys will see what I'm talking about and why I did the blue shadow color first.
So as you guys can hopefully see, doing that toned layer first means I can pretty much apply this in one layer and already get my color variation, my this is in the shadows sort of effect. And while I will probably continue to work the brown on the exterior, after this layer of brown, I'm done for that part of the display case because it's behind glass. And one of the sort of visual tricks I use to indicate something is behind glass is it gets, it tends to be more muted in color and it gets a lot less detail, like the glass is obscuring it. Now in real life, that wouldn't necessarily be the case, but when you're doing illustration and you're doing comics, using visual shorthands, having visual shorthands and stylistic choices, it, that's just part of what we do. We're, we're creating a language. So we're not just depicting the way things are in reality. We're depicting the way things people see them, how people see things in their head, how they think things should be and how they think things are. And sometimes that is more truthful to a reader than using a photo and going straight from photo reference. course doing studies from reference and working from reference can kind of help you build up a visual vocabulary like that that you turn to when you need ideas or when you want to know how to handle something just a little bit of the brown so that the glass appears translucent Then I'm going to take the brown we mixed earlier and see if I can zoom you guys in any more. I would love a different camera setup. Working on that though. We're working on that. Been talking wall mounted and I'm kind of just doing like a squiggle effect. All right, some dots, some squiggles just to kind of indicate like a moist, airy cake. And I may even have to go in and do another layer of that if there isn't enough contrast. I'm just kind of dance in my brush over the paper. You see, this is something I need some reference for. Bring me a cake. Although I've eaten and drawn enough cake that probably I don't need the reference, but I would like the reference. Bring me the reference, the delicious reference. That's why you should paint things you like so that you can have an excuse to consume and enjoy the things you like. All right, so I think my delicious little cakey will probably need another layer. I'm gonna grab some more Van Dyke Brown and grab some sepia. Try to mix it a little darker without losing sort of the color depth and the warmth that we've got going on. And then wet into wet. I'm just gonna dab a little bit of our darker mix on the side that's away from the light. Maybe even get brave and do something much more concentrated. Just to really kind of develop those colors. Now, before I go too much further on her dress, I'm going to want to continue developing her skin and then start on her hair. Mostly because like we talked about earlier, reds can be a little tricky. Can be a little prone 
to bleeding. Now, this could probably be a darker color. Just been trying to avoid mixing it darker because I sometimes have trouble doing color matching when it comes to things like skin tones, important, noticeable things. which I think I'm going to have to do because this contrast is just not enough. That's one of the big problems I've noticed with my watercolor illustrations is when I can't get the contrast striking enough, then things start to get kind of flat and boring. So I'm going to grab yellow ochre. And then I'm going to grab Scarlet and I'll give this a chance to dry and then I'll go back in with that. I'm also going to have to clean out some of the wells in my palette because I have like four wells that are all various types of Payne's Gray and I need those wells. So that is going to be my next project. Okay, this has had a chance to dry. I'm going to go ahead and do another layer on our skin. Hopefully I did a good job matching. Oh, still not quite dark enough. And we kind of do our test in an area where it's not as noticeable. That way, if it's not a good color match, if it's too light, if it's too dark, you can see it in real time on the paper, on the figure, but it's not going to negatively affect what you've just done. So I'm going to add in more yellow ochre, add in more scarlet, give what I just painted a chance to dry and try again. While I wait for that to dry though, I can work on that cake. So the side facing away from the light is looking pretty good. I may go in with a really saturated brown and just kind of add some like really dark low lights to make it look particularly moist. But otherwise it's looking good so far. Just kind of reinforcing the spongy, cakey texture. And I'm going to want to go really dark, I think, for the frosting. And then kind of reserve the drizzle on top as a lighter shade of brown. So it will look like milk chocolate and dark chocolate. So I'm going to go ahead right now and I want to leave plenty of room for highlights. All right, so I'm going to give that a chance to dry and the skin is dry. I could go back into that, but I think what I'm going to do is actually go in with another layer of our red, which is kind of light, we could go darker with this. Leaving some room for highlights in the bow. Remember, we're gonna make that look like satin. I'm gonna go a lot darker 
with the red on the bow. I may end up going darker with the red on the dress. Kind of leaning away from that though, because I do kind of want some variation between what we've got going on. Also, honestly, so much of this is already kind of dark because of the tabletop. I don't necessarily want to make the image as a whole a lot darker. a little bit and blend that out a little bit. And I got a little bit of red on her knee. So I want to clean that up. And then going to clean out some of these wells so that I actually have room to do a little more color mixing. All right, so before I start in on painting her hair, I'm going to darken, work on darkening the skin tone because like with the red of her dress, once we start painting the hair, we're not going to be able to do sort of light, loose glazes. We're going to have to work a lot tighter and with less water. And I think we're finally getting some of the contrast we need to help define her face. All right, looking pretty good there. So going to take some of that brown I mixed for the cake display. I'm going to add another layer. And I'm just doing that not necessarily to make it darker, but really just to bring kind of the saturation up. So going to use this opportunity to add another layer of green to the strawberry leaves. As well as some dainty little veins there. And then we're going to use this first layer of the brown I mixed up for her hair. I'm going to go ahead and kind of test that out in her eyes. That's even too light for her freckles. So before I can do her hair, I'm going to have to mix that darker. All right, so I'm gonna need to start really thinking about my background, but before I do that, I'm going to do another layer on the glass here. Just sort of following the reflection lines I set for myself earlier. Trying to be really careful to make sure that my reflections are the correct angle. And of course, working around the foreground elements does make it 
quite a bit more difficult, but I think the end result is going to be really nice. Yeah, I think that glass is looking pretty good. Do a little work here also on the foreground glass. I still need to think about what I'm going to do for the wall and for the door. All right. So after some deliberation, I think because I'm going by the colors based on the IDC website, I think it would be a good move to do this green in the background. Now, part of the concern is that this image is already kind of dark and this is going to make it darker, but it's also going to make it feel more like the Ink Drop Cafe, like you're inside the Ink Drop Cafe. And plus this teal color is kind of a candy color, so it kind of goes with the whole like sweets theme I've got going anyway. And because it's a cool color, it's going to recede into the background. So then the real concern kind of becomes, well, what should I paint that door? While I'm messing with this color, I'm gonna go into that napkin. Hopefully this will add, I don't know, a little more dimensionality to it. It's just something about the napkin that's kind of bugging me, so. I think the green in the background was a, a good choice. So the other color that is very commonly associated with Ink Drop Cafe is kind of like a navy dark blue. Now I don't want to go navy. Maybe like a blue green would be fun. Like a dark blue green, so. Running out of paint wells to mix that in, I need to clean out some of these Payne's grays. And then do a light wash of a blue green. Kind of find places I can rest my hand. One of the frustrating things about doing traditional art and also kind of one of the beautiful things about doing traditional art is that sometimes you have to live and die by your color choices. I can probably tweak bad colors digitally to an extent, but some things are just stuck. So it's a good thing I'm actually liking that blue and that green and I feel like it works because if I didn't, um, I can glaze over it but it's still gonna be there and it's still gonna influence other colors. So that's why sometimes I deliberate so much about something that can kind of feel a little arbitrary to those of you who might be more used to digital art because I, can't, I just can't fix it that easily. So I'm gonna let that dry. I think I'm gonna do a darker variation for the door jam. And then I think I might even let this just sit for the night, call it an evening, let my brain kind of recoup start tomorrow nice and fresh All right so let's go ahead and finish working on that door i'm not going to add much detail to the background just because that is not where i want the viewers focus And if that door frame dries too light, I'm gonna put another darker layer up 
on it. I'm not sure yet how dark it's going to dry, but it looks like it's probably going to dry not dark enough to kind of sort of stand out from the door itself. Otherwise, though, the background is definitely coming along. So I think what I'm going to do, other than maybe going in and adjusting that door frame, is I think I'm going to step away from it for the evening. It's mostly dry, but just give the paints a chance to settle. Tomorrow, I'm going to work on adding blush to Kara's cheeks and doing the shadow color on her as well as sort of developing what she's wearing. And then I'll just kind of expand out from there. So I think I'm pretty much done with all of the, or almost all of the Payne's grays I've mixed up. So it'll be nice to just wipe those out so I'll have room for the other colors I'm gonna need tomorrow. And um, I'll look for it, or wait, I just realized I can actually do one more thing because I'd mixed the white for her shirt darker and then I never went and filled it in. So I'll do that now. All right. So I'm going to let this dry and oh, but you know, I can also, while I'm here, do some work on her teeth. And on my eyes, and this is how watercolor always goes. As soon as you're getting ready to pack up for the evening, you see like three things you could just do really quick. That's actually one of the things that I kind of like about watercolor is that it always finds a way to kind of pull me back in and keep me engaged. All right, so I'm going to clean out that other Payne's gray and let this dry and I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, guys, so this has had a chance to dry overnight. I'm going to go ahead and mix up a couple of colors. I'm mixing up first the shadow color for her skin. And I don't want anything too dark since our image is already kind of dark. So I'm going to grab a little bit of naphthal, naphthamide maroon. and a little bit of permanent mauve. And shadow colors for skin are one of those kind of tricky areas because if you do it wrong, you can end up over applying and kind of ruining the contrast of the skin. And I'm gonna switch over now to a smaller brush just so I can get in there and get all the details. And I wish that color What's our final dry color? Because it All right, so while that dries, I'll mix it a little bit darker. And I'm also going to want to apply the blush to her cheeks. And I probably should have done that first, but this layer is so light, I kind of feel like it doesn't really prevent me from doing that. So I'm going to grab some of the same red 
that I had used for her dress and water it down. So other than the cheeks, lips, and tips of the fingers, I pretty much put it everywhere, their shadow. And that's because you put a little bit of red anywhere skin kind of crosses over skin. So anywhere skin might cast a shadow is a good place to put some blush. So I'm gonna go in with a little more red and just sort of tighten some of those areas that should be blushy up a little bit, make them a little darker. And then after that dries, I'm gonna go back in with the skin shadow and shade that. So I've been giving the red of her dress some thought and usually when I approach reds, before I start getting into saturated colors, I whip out the um, naphthamide maroon and use that as kind of an under color because it's hard to do glazes on top of like thickly applied reds or strongly applied reds. Uh, they tend to get muddy and bleed more than they tend to actually take a glaze really well. So that's sort of my method of kind of working around. Although the pink is a really cute color, I'm definitely gonna want the strawberry at least and her hair bow to be actually red. But while I wait for that to dry, I'm going to go in, and this is the color I mixed last night, so it's had time to evaporate and become a stronger color. And Holbein Cherry Red and Windsor Newton Alizer Alizarin Crimson, a lizard rim, crimson. Combine to make a really nice pink. I think this color is going to be good for the dress. I might not want to go any pinker than that, or any redder than that, rather. But I'm still going to want to shade a little bit with the naphthamide maroon. All right, that's looking pretty good. All right, so the skin has had a chance to dry. I'm gonna go in again with the shadow color. And it should be just the right darkness now, at least I hope. Looks like it. I don't want to do too much, you guys know I have a tendency to kind of go overboard and overwork things, so that is not what I want to do here. Face is looking a little bit purple on the right hand side. That's okay. I still have my original skin tone mix. It's evaporated overnight. So I'm going to give it a quick stir, let this dry, and then see what I can do about that. So looking at her face now that it's dried, it's not as purple. I'm still going to go in with a little bit of that original skin tone from yesterday.
and just sort of darken some of the areas. Give a little bit of definition back into the face. I have a tendency to do to like lose sort of um, the planes of a face through over blending. Hopefully this won't be too harsh. As we know, watercolor dries lighter, then it goes down. But I think when it dries, it'll It'll be good. I'm gonna blend out on the arm a little bit just because it's kind of a harsh line there. And do the same kind of on the bridge of the nose and at the top of the head. Float in a little extra peach over on the side of the face, but I think that's going to work really well. I'm satisfied with it at least. All right, so she's looking kind of dark right now, but hopefully that'll dry a little bit lighter and then we can move on to doing her hair. All right, so her skin actually dried. Okay, now I'm going to commit further sacrilege because I'm going to add a little bit more of darker shadow. Could ruin it, could overwork it. I'm using a much smaller brush here because I wanna cover just kind of a delicate, fine cast shadow area. I'm not looking to like significantly alter the planes on Kara's face or anything like that. Okay, I think that's actually a perfect amount. Parfait. We did it guys. So I'm gonna grab some of the brown from the display case yesterday. Just add another. Another layer of brown in there. Now, I need to start thinking about my naphthamide, naphthamide, sorry, maroon shadow color. Because that's what I'm going to use rather than say a purple, but a purple would also work. That's what I'm primarily going to use to give shadow to the dress, to her ribbon, and to the strawberry back there. Actually, since I've got like a nice pink already mixed, I'm going to go ahead, go in the background here, get that strawberry. The 
because as we discussed yesterday, the way I'm handling glass, I'm going to have it mute colors. Just to have kind of a strawberry drizzle. Then I'll make the interior of this cake strawberry. Wasn't really a fan of strawberry cake until I went to Japan because their strawberry cakes taste like actual strawberry, very fresh and delicious. Use just a little bit on her cheeks, on, on her lips. We've got a little strawberry girl and a bunch of strawberry cakes. I don't know if it gets much cuter than that. Before I get too much further, I want to go ahead and do some of the chocolate cakes in the background. I'm going to water down the brown from last night, the brown we used to make our foreground chocolate cake. I want this to be lighter because this is behind glass. And I'm going to make this one a chocolate cake. And I'm going to give this one a chocolate layer. And maybe chocolate frosting on the sides. And in a moment, I can take away these clips. I'm getting in the way. And I'm just not adding that much water to the paper. So I'm not super concerned about the paper buckling all over the place anymore. Also grab just a little bit of green for the strawberry leaves here in the background as well. I think I'm gonna also grab some pink, water it down, and use that to do a light pink frosting. For the bottom of the cake here. And for the body of this cake, I'm trying to keep my palette kind of limited. So that way, the background doesn't look too distracting. But we still have something kind of going on we want this to feel like a place that's kind of lived in if that makes sense and I'll go back later and fix some of those dots since got a little bit sloppy but I think it's starting to come together now there's an awful lot of red hmm. maybe I should make that top cake a chocolate cake also except the chocolate kind of blends in with the background just add a touch of shading just to kind of help separate it and then just kind of take a moment to look at everything consider everything you know a moment to chill okay I'm going to mix up her hair color from last night. It's probably, it's evaporated a little bit, but it's still probably too light. We're going to find out by doing another layer in her eyes. And I'm leaving kind of the bottom part. Let me zoom in so you guys can see. So I left kind of a crescent at the bottom. And if I move to a really fine point, I can use that color 
to go ahead and start doing her freckles. And I usually do Kara's freckles in a few layers. All right, that's our first layer of freckles. I'm going to use a watered down version of that color to do kind of kind of do the same thing for this cake up here. Okay, those are looking pretty good. My apologies, you guys actually missed all the magic. So I did the top up there and this cake here with a lighter shade of the same color we're using for, we used for Kara's freckles. I'm gonna go ahead and activate those half pans with some water. Start building up that color. Next, I want to start doing the darker chocolate on this cake here. sort of finessing the background sweets, but they're looking really good. Kind of makes you hungry, right? I'm always hungry for sweets though. I think if I'm feeling better, I'll go buy myself a little cake to celebrate our anniversary on Saturday. It's been a lot of work. Definitely deserve a treat. With the naphthamide maroon and permanent mauve. So I'm gonna let that dry and then go in a little bit darker just here and there, like mostly on that knee. But I've kind of procrastinated enough. So let's go and get going on the top of our cake. And I'm going to want to leave highlights I want this to look like a yummy and although this is a really nice rich color I'm gonna have to mix it darker just so that I get the contrast that I want. Because right now it's almost the same color as the cake itself, which is not what I wanted. Yeah, see, there's just not enough contrast there. It's a good first layer though. Good start. I'm 
leaves this room to go a little darker. Yeah, that's gonna look very delicious though when I'm finished. So I'm feeling good about our chocolate cake. So now it's time to go ahead and paint our second layer of chocolate frosting. And I'm mixing in some sepia and some more Van Dyke Brown. I might even just need to work like directly with those colors. And I'm gonna grab, I think a little bit of like purple and naphthamide maroon. Like I said earlier, I like, when I paint chocolate things, I like them to be kind of a warm chocolate color. Plus, using a warm chocolate color in this illustration will kind of add maybe a little more vibrancy back into the image. I personally am not much of a baker. I don't really have like the patience to bake and plus so many places do an excellent job kind of filling that need for me. But painting something like this really makes me kind of want to do like an ink drop cafe cafe at a con or something. I know that's so much effort, but I think it would be really cute. Although I don't know that it would act, if we were a cosplay group, it would serve our purposes. But as a comic group, I don't think it would necessarily serve our purposes, but it would be fun and it would be cute and it would be a good way to talk to people, but it would not. This is not dark enough. Um, it would not actually serve what we need. So when I was in Japan, I went to the International Manga Museum in Kyoto and they have kind of a manga cafe. And it sells, um, the food they sell there is just kind of like, like basic like if we were in America I would say like stadium food kind of stuff like just kind of standard things nothing like exceptionally exciting the food is good like I'm not crashing on the food but the point of the cafe is not um not necessarily like the best food you've ever eaten and it's not like themed like it's not manga themed um but they have mangaka and comic artists from you know, all over Japan and also like France and like the US because Pendleton Ward and Natasha, Natasha Alighieri have art on the walls there. And like it was actually drawn by those artists on the walls in Sharpie. So some of them look like they were drawn in Sharpie, which I really appreciate because I really appreciate when artists kind of embrace the medium they're working with. And then some of them you can like tell somebody like really spent a lot of time to get that art on the wall, which is also legit also on board with that and to me that's kind of what a manga cafe should be one day i want to open up a coffee shop and i want it to be a comics and coffee shop so i want to have like a lending library kind of thing going on and i want art on the walls and originals on the walls so you can believe that going to the manga cafe in Kyoto was really inspirational for me. And I actually have video of it, not great video, but video of it um, that I need to edit and share with the public. Because I think a lot of people would enjoy that and would benefit from getting to experience that even if it's just secondhand. Okay, so I'm gonna let the cake dry. I'm going to add some black too because I don't know if I can really get it as dark as I want it to go. While I do that, I can at least work on her hair a bit. Get that first level, first layer in there.
I bring that up because if there were a physical ink drop cafe, and that is not what I'm going to name my retirement coffee shop, by the way, I think it would be full of people's art, although so many of the artists in our collective do digital art. So I guess we'd have to do like dash reproductions to best represent that, but full of people's art and illustrations and just like a really cute but homey atmosphere where people want to like stay and talk about comics or read comics and draw comics and like they just feel inspired when they're in the building. So I guess a cafe that makes no money. Could sell art supplies. Fictional Ink Drop Cafe has an art supply counter. Also sells replacement styluses and things of that nature. Pencil grips to put on your Surface Pro styluses so they don't eat your hands. All the little considerations that artists appreciate and that art stores don't think about. And great coffee and great hot chocolate and great sweets. <laughs> and also maybe savory pastries. Because not everybody likes sweets, right? Some people like savory things. Sometimes you're hungry and you don't want to eat sugar. You want to eat food. All right, I'm going to add another layer to our strawberry here. And for those of you who are worried about me when I said earlier that I was sick, I'm actually feeling a lot better today. I think I sound a lot better too. My energy levels are starting to come back. So I'm definitely on the mend. And don't worry, other than this, I'm taking it pretty easy. This is like the big area I'm expending energy. Oh, I don't know why I went into red. I want chocolate. Just add a little bit of extra brown. looks pretty good. I would drink that hot chocolate. All right, hopefully we've got a dark enough mix for the chocolate cake. I might have to switch my brush out. I grabbed the wrong one. The cake looks good to me. It's like a little piece of brownie cake. Just like exactly how I like my chocolate cake. Well, not exact. I mean, I like all chocolate cakes. Who am I kidding? I have room in my heart for all of the types of chocolate cakes. But fudgy brownie chocolate cakes. That one's amazing right now. Could go for that. Just reminds me that when I have some quote unquote free time, I really want to paint more food just because I like to eat. And painting food is fun. Hmm. Okay, so my next steps, I'm kind of nearing that almost finished point, which is wonderful and scary at the same time. 
So it's kind of when it becomes like make or break and it's time to start cleaning up your line, stuff like that. Also means I have to start making some scary choices. So I'm gonna let the chocolate cake dry because I need, I wanna do another layer on the icing and, or on the drizzle rather, and I need that well before I can move on. And I could totally go grab another daisy well, but I literally just don't have the space on my desk for it. So I'm trying to be frugal with space considerations. So, a treat myself I should totally invest in when I have the funds is my brushes are getting really chewed up and dull. And it is about time for me to swap some of these out or mark them with paint so that I know not to use them as like detail brushes and reinvest in some nice brushes that can hold a nice point. just because it would make my life a lot easier and my paintings would look a lot prettier and a lot cleaner. That ability to get really fine detail when you're working kind of in an illustrative detailed style like this is really important. Your brush can do a lot of your work for you. Now we're doing our second layer of freckles. Honestly, Jerry's has a sale right now on their Creative Mark Rhapsody brushes, so maybe I should take the plunge, spend the money. It'll get used. Then, remember way back when, when we mixed our Skin Shadow Darker? I know, silly noises. It makes the difference. It's how you successfully paint. True secret. Okay. Think. I wish it would dry that color, but it's not because it's watercolor. Watercolor dries lighter than it goes down. But let's add a little bit of the darker color we mix since really want slightly darker chocolate. My big concern is I just don't want it to look like I didn't paint it. I didn't want it to look like it had just been neglected. So now I can clean out that well and go get a fresh cup of water and get started on doing my Napamide Maroon shadows. Before I do that, I'm gonna grab a little Hunter Green, a little Undersea Green. of shadow to the leaves yes I like that all right it's been much talked about 
it is time to mix the naphthamide maroon. And I'm gonna use it on the dress and I'm gonna use it on the strawberry. And I am not going to pollute the red I originally mixed because I wanna be able to pull from that if I need to. So I'm gonna use naphthamide maroon and cherry red and alizarin crimson and that's gonna give me hopefully a nice warm but muted sort of shadow color. I don't wanna to go too blue because it's gonna get kind of muddy and we already have enough problems with muddy, I feel like. So I'm gonna start on the dress. A big floppy squirrel brush here, which might not be the wisest choice. Requires a really delicate hand. And sometimes that can be hard to do. However, I think it's a pretty good color choice. And it certainly does a good job of muting this color. Now I'm gonna grab a little clean water. and just soften that. It's a little bit of a harsh transition. Now for anything darker than pink, I'm gonna need to work a little darker and more saturated. than this. And if you ever wonder why I stop mid-sentence when I'm talking to you guys while I'm painting, it's because I am pulling a line and I'm trying to be steady and I do that by controlling my breathing. So I'm gonna let those have a chance to dry and I'm gonna go ahead and mix all of my colors darker and more saturated. So more naphthamide maroon, more cherry red, and more alizarin crimson. So now that I have a darker mix, I'm gonna go ahead and use this to do the low light shading on the strawberry. And I'm gonna paint over this with a red, but you see it's still kind of watery, it's kind of glazy. If I did this over a red at this consistency, I might have control problems. Let me do the same thing for her ribbon. So this allows me to start adding in shadow that's gonna show through without necessarily getting a lot of reactivation or a lot of lifting up, which are things I wanna avoid. Man, I kind of like that color so much that I kind of want to keep going in the Kara's dress and utilizing it. So I'm going to let this dry and go grab a napkin. So something I meant to start working on and haven't is I actually think I want her belt not to be white. I think I want it to be a darker red. Originally, I was going to make her dress like all red, basically, with white sleeves and I ended up going for pink, which I think is a better choice. So I'm gonna do this as kind of a base and let that dry. And then I'm gonna go in with that maroon mix we just did. And I think when those dry, I might sink some more concentrated maroon in like here, 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 the areas that are really in shadow. But you guys can see how just adding that has really kind of muted those colors.
All right, guys, I hope you're ready because we're gonna start painting some red. So I'm grabbing some of the red mix from earlier, which I could show you, but the camera just doesn't work like that. I'm also grabbing some alizarin crimson, a lot of alizarin crimson, and I'm going to grab a lot of cherry red. And the goal is just to work more and more concentrated and maybe even add some aptamide maroon if we're not getting dark enough. So we'll start over here on our little friend, the straw. Looking good so far. It's a good concentration of red. Next up. Do a layer on Kara's ribbon and then the satin ribbon up here. Some areas I want to darken just so they kind of stand out more provide more contrast, more interest. It's a really pretty color. It's not quite dark enough for some areas, but it's still really cute. I think I'm also going to use it to tighten up some details on her dress, but I'm not gonna use it with this big squirrel brush. So when it dries, it's not quite red enough. So we can definitely go redder for certain accents, but I'm gonna give this a chance to dry before I do that. Now this is a nice dark red, pretty well suited for this purpose. We're actually able to get a little bit of contrast going. And we're able to get a really nice red strawberry. That looks like a delicious strawberry. And then grab a little bit of the naphthamide maroon. Just use it here and there to make the darker red pop a little bit and have a little bit of shadow. And this is one of my favorite colors. It's a Daniel Smith color and I use the heck out of it. Definitely a great investment for my collection. Hmm. And it seems like we're making some really good progress. It might be time to start applying shadow colors and then we can start doing um, kind of our final details and tightening everything up. All right, guys. So what's really left to finish with this is to do sort of a shadow color. 
And then to do tighter details using like opaque white and color pencils and watercolor pencils. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to step away from this for the evening, give my brain a chance to recoup, give myself time to like think about things, that sort of thing. It's always nice to step away and come back with fresh eyes, especially if you're switching over to an, you know, the next big important step sort of thing. And this is a really good opportunity to do that. So I will see you guys with this painting tomorrow. Hey guys, so we are on day three of this watercolor painting and I continued to make some notes last night. I felt that the lighting was kind of inconsistent and I want to try and fix it in the shadow stage. And I kind of want to focus on my lighting coming from the top left since that's already kind of the direction it's in. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix up a shadow color. My favorite is a combination of dioxine violet with a neutral tint or Payne's gray. Ooh, I mixed that kind of strong. And I usually try to use the same least family of variation for my neutral tint across the page. So I'm going to start with a light mix and mix it more concentrated as we go along. And I think I've got a good base for that. And I'm just sort of testing it out in an inconspicuous area that will actually tell me whether or not it's useful. It's a little bit light can, however, use it. On the most shaded areas of Kara's skin. And I wish it would dry that color because that would work really well. And I can also use it on the white cup and the white plate. As well as the white on her sleeve. So basically all of our lightest areas. And what we're doing is a very light glaze. So you guys have probably heard or seen me talk about glazes in the past. This would be considered a glaze. And you can probably see why we wouldn't want to apply something like this to a heavily painted area. We're working with such a light glaze, such a watery amount of paint. Anything heavily painted is going to kind of reactivate and lift up. All right, so now I let this dry. Now that that layer's dried, I'm going to go in with just a little bit more of the same color, but pretty much only in the white. I don't want to mess with her skin too much because I have a really bad tendency of overworking skin tones. And then I'm going to mix it a little bit darker. And I really like how this shadow color is more purple right now than it is a neutral or a gray. It's just a little bit warmer. And since this illustration is already kind of dark, I'd rather go warm and dark than cool and dark. And there's also a lot of warm tones in this illustration anyway. So I'm mixing some Dioxine purple, a little bit of Holbein, not Holbein, Windsor neutral tint and Payne's gray together to get a darker variation of my shadow color. I'm gonna use that here in my parfait glass. And 
gonna use that here. And here. just a little bit here on her shirt. This is still wet, so I'll drop a little bit in there. And I don't wanna put any in the display case since we kind of established this rule for how we're handling things behind glass. I do kind of want to knock the door and the wall back a little bit. So I'm going to, in sections, glaze the door first. And I'm gonna to need to go grab a tissue so I can pick up all the excess water. And then I'm going to glaze the wall. And after these dry, I'll go ahead and do the door jam. And I'm just doing that to prevent any sort of bleeding since the blues I use are kind of strong colors. And then after that dries, I think I'm gonna do another layer on the door jam just to make it darker. One of the things that I really like about using shadow colors is it gives me an opportunity to kind of go back and build up contrast in some areas and create definition in some areas where maybe I was just a lot less successful. So we're gonna mix, cause I'm aiming to do the shadows on the napkin and on the tabletop. I don't want the tabletop to get too dark because it's already kind of dark. So we're gonna mix our shadow tone a little bit darker and I kind of like this as just a generic shadow tone. The only thing I'm hesitant about using this as a shadow tone for is on skin because it tends to desaturate skin a lot. Even for darker skin tones where I will use more purple, I also use a lot of like darker red to kind of offset how much a color like this will desaturate. So actually, want to do a little bit of this on the dress and I may use just flat out purple to shade the darker more red area just kind of loosen that up a little bit I think that purple is going to be or rather this shadow tone is going to be a good one Put that in there and then under there. Oh, if only it dried as dark as it's going down, that would be perfect. Unfortunately, it lightens a bit. So we're just gonna have to keep an eye on it and see how it dries. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm doing tricky watercolor areas, I will totally stick my tongue out of my mouth like a five-year-old drawing a pony. Oh, that's right. We need to do the door jam. Night already mixed it darker. Oh no. Not a big deal. I wanted to paint the door jam a darker shade anyway, so this is a good reminder for me to do so. So I'll go ahead and do that and then activate 
the blues I'm going to use to paint that a darker shade. And for now, I'm just going to let this dry and see how I feel about it. All right, so I'm going to go in and paint that door jam a little bit darker. Sometimes with doing shadow colors, you do it kind of at an in-between stage before you really finish painting the object. And that is because, like we talked about earlier, when you're applying such a thin glaze, um, it'll reactivate thickly painted colors. So this can be really a useful tool for influencing colors and um, just sort of developing contrast and developing colors over kind of a longer period of time. So I'm mixing my shadow color a little bit darker. Because I want more contrast. And I'm also going to want not just the sort of shadows we get as an object curves away from the light, but I'm going to want cast shadows to be kind of distinct. Now, we're almost dark enough that I can start doing some of the shadow on the cake. And I think we're dark enough that I can probably start doing some of the shadow on the table. If I do it too early on, I'm going to lose a lot of my opportunity for developing contrast. And it'll just make the table look darker rather than like it's got shadows on it. All right, time for kind of the true test where we start applying shadow color as a cast shadow to the marble tabletop. And way earlier on, you guys will remember, I established a lot of blue, like urban blue violet in the shadow or for the shadows on the tabletop and I don't know for some reason it doesn't really work for me visually that's not really the color I wanted so I'm just kind of re-establishing it kind of redoing it with a color that's going to be a little more consistent with the shading and the rest of the piece. Because I think that's a part of the problem is since I didn't go with urban blue violet for the rest of my shadow colors, it doesn't feel right. So I want to cover more of this area in shadow since we discussed establishing the light source. Okay, so the shadow on the table could be a little darker in some areas. So I'm going to go ahead and mix that up now. And then I need to start on the cake. And then we're finally at the point where we can start moving on to really tight details and getting this kind of finished up. So getting to the exciting point. I've noticed that with my watercolor illustrations that have ink line arts, I can usually finish them a lot quicker because the details don't need to be as tight. Whereas illustrations like this that have a pencil line art take longer because I'm trying to pull tighter details.
This stage is also one of the more tiring stages because the paint is drying fast enough that I can pretty much work continuously. In the prior stages, because the paint took time to dry, I was able to step away and take breaks. But unless I make it a priority to take a break at this stage, I am pretty tied to my table. That said, I do think it is really important to make it a point to take breaks when you're watercoloring for the good of your painting and for the good of yourself. And if you have a hard time justifying doing it for yourself, keep in mind that your hand is gonna drag through wet paint and it can really ruin things. Or you do kind of suffer from fatigue. You're gonna make poor choices. Your hand might start shaking. It's just good to make it a point to take breaks and kind of recoup and come back with fresh eyes so that you can make the best decisions possible. Okay, I'm grabbing some purple. So I can do, hopefully this will turn out well, some of the shadows on the cake, like the darker chocolate of the cake. If it dried that color out, would be great. But we'll see. We're working thick enough that it might. But watercolor sometimes has a mind of its own. It's one of the beautiful things about it and one of the frustrating things about it. I think it'll work though. I'm using a little bit of purple to kind of delineate detail on those leaves as well. Then I'm going to go in to the spoon because I've lost some of the depth that I had. So some saturated purple in the bow and on her belt. Hopefully that'll kind of work out the way I see it in my head. So um, we're almost finished, if not fairly finished, with doing the shadows. The next step I want to work on is tightening up some of the details. And one of the first things I want to do is I want to work on Kara's hair. And I find that for me, this tends to be a turning point in my illustrations. It's kind of when things really, really start to come together. So I've got some Van Dyke Brown all mixed up. I'm gonna start in her eyes. And then move on to her eyebrows. And I'm using 
my blue painter's tape as a bit of a palette and as kind of a place where I can squeegee off excess paint. And I want to make sure I leave lots of room for highlights and to help kind of leave room for contrast. I've mentioned kind of seeking something I've called visual bounce. And that's just when there's lots of contrast, lots of lights and darks against each other. Makes for a much more interesting watercolor And sometimes I'll go back and add additional colors to areas I've already kind of covered. Just building up those layers. I'll zoom in actually so you guys can better see. Especially since she's kind of in the middle of our shot, so it makes it convenient. All right. I think that's actually looking a lot better and a lot tighter already, so I am excited to see how that kind of develops. I'm going to detour just a little bitty bit. I'm going to reactivate some of that skin tone because I Ha still have my daisy palette. It's still got the colors in it. I just allowed them to evaporate. And I'm going to use this to kind of tighten up some of the skin details just a little bit. And I like doing it this way because I get a much more accurate color match. But for Caucasian skin tones, you can pretty much use a burnt sienna for the same effect. And this is also just a really handy effect when you're working with penciled liner and it's something I really use a lot with my little mini con commissions because it really helps tighten the piece up. You don't have to do it everywhere. You can think of it as kind of like inking the piece. And I usually like to do this before I start adding the white accents. So the watercolor in the palette has pretty much entirely evaporated, leaving kind of a thick layer of evaporated color. And a lot of people will work from like butcher's trays and just kind of keep reactivating the same colors, remixing, reactivating. And that is great. Like if you have the room to do that and you don't have cat hair that gets in everything you do, that can be the way to go, especially if you're painting one off illustrations or one off pieces and you're not doing comic pages where you burn through that really quickly. And I mean, shoot, if you can get it to work for your comic pages, that's also great. I am 100% not slamming that method. And someday I'd like to be able to work in that method, but I have cats, so. That means I have cat hair, it gets into everything, and they get into everything, and they knock everything over. So it's not super feasible for me. I used to think my desk was safe until I found it destroyed. So there isn't even an out of the way place that I can put my stuff. That is a really viable method and very similar to what I'm showing you guys here. I wanted you guys to be aware of it because I think it would be a great solution for some artists or is a great solution for some artists. It's just not one 
I demonstrate often because it's not one that's really feasible for me personally. And I'm going to do her eyelashes, but I'm not doing them right now. You can also use that same technique for any color that you've mixed. And now you want a darker variation of that color. That's why I hold on to my Daisy palette and the colors I've mixed and let them evaporate because they come in handy later on. And it does mean having open paint out, which kind of has its own problems, but it has saved me so much time and pain over the years that I find it worth it. And I even use this technique when I'm painting Kara pages. Now you're seeing the page tilt because early on in the process, I popped a power brick under there to kind of elevate the page, make it easier for you guys to see and easier for me to work. Unfortunately, now that I'm doing kind of detailed work, that wobbling is just not an acceptable thing. So either I need to do two power bricks, which I don't have, or find some other suitable replacement, or it's time to just remove it all together. And when you're doing tight details like this, especially if you're a comic artist, you'll probably know what I mean. Use a brush that you would use for inking. So make sure, even if you take garbage quality care of all your other brushes, make sure your detail brush is in fighting condition, good condition, because you're basically going to be inking with watercolor. And this might be a stage you opt to skip. Maybe you work a little looser than I do. Maybe you work a lot larger. You don't need this stage. Um, maybe you're working way oversized and when you reduce your image, it's going to be tight enough that this would get lost. As I've said many other times, not every watercolor technique works for every artist. But this is one I happen to really like. I like how it looks in other people's art. I like how it looks in my art, so I use it fairly frequently. Also might be kind of like a duh technique, like of course we would do that, Becca. Well, you know. different artists are kind of at different stages of their development and their learning their in their careers and some people learn tech some techniques later because they didn't have someone to show them and I really noticed that like some of the techniques that everyone writes off as being like really basic and don't cover them those are the ones that people need to learn and they need to see demonstrated because it's just so taken for granted that everyone had kind of the same watercolor background, so. That is not the case for self-taught artists, it's often, or self-guided, I should say. Self-guided artists um, may not have the outside guidance to help them learn some of the more basic techniques just because it's not something that's typically covered. So, you know, it's important to kind of revisit the basics sometimes. So I'm gonna let Kara kind of dry. Um, I'm going to grab some Payne's Gray and work on tightening up the spoon just a bit. And if you have shaky hands, it's going to be the most nerve wracking part of the process because lots of room for error, doing a lot of tight work. So ideally, those of you who are painting along, get as good an angle as you possibly can. I am like all catawampus hunched over it. Not in the best position. Making 
some sometimes kind of dumb mistakes just because I can't get quite the angle I want. But that's one of the sacrifices anyone who's demonstrating something makes is there's always a quality. I think that's one of the better spoons I painted though. So even if my overall quality has not been as great, at least I painted a good spoon. Believe it or not, that would come up in seven inch Kara. So it's a good thing to have learned how to do. Tightening up the glass here hopefully these accents aren't too dark and hopefully once I start adding my white highlights it'll have like a lot of visual pop and just look like the glass is really reflective I'm going to give this a chance to dry and then I'm going to start working on tightening up the plate and the cup So for the teacup, I am going to go in with an opaque white. So I don't want to cover the whole rim. I do want to outline it though. So I'm trying to think about where we get the outline. So I'm going to do the same on a shirt with her shirt i am going to use a mixture of the same paint spray i'm using on the cup i'm just going to hit some of those low lights and then i'm going to come in with a lighter version of the color and get those as well and this is Seriously, one of the more exciting parts of doing this sort of illustration because this is, like I said, when everything starts. Forgot to mic up. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys could hear that, so I'm going to kind of repeat myself. So I am using Payne's Gray and I'm doing some of the whites with the Payne's Gray. Now, Payne's Gray can be kind of dark for that. So I'm gonna use a combination of Payne's Gray and then a lighter variation of it. And I'm not outlining the entire rim because I want some color play, some shadow play between um, Payne's Gray and white. So probably gonna end up using like three colors to outline the Payne's Gray. And this is, for me, one of the most exciting parts of doing a watercolor illustration because this is when, for this type of illustration, for me, um, things start really tightening up. They start coming together. You can start seeing more of the contrast, more color play. So that might be a little much. I'm just gonna blend that out for now. And come back to it after it's had a chance to kind of dry. Got a little wavy over here where the paper is just a little bit buckly. So I'll kind of blend that out and it'll be less noticeable because it's going to blend into the shadow of the plate. And I'm going to go ahead and move over now to just sort of that lighter color we talked about. And I'm still, I'm not even mixing anything new. I'm just using the dried out versions of colors from the past two days.
I let this dry and give myself kind of time to think about it. But I am going to go in to my strawberry with naphthal violet or naphthamide maroon. There we go. That's the right, that's the right color. And a little bit of dioxine purple. And just kind of do the darkest part of the strawberry. So we are at the point where it's time to start filling in our squiddies. And I don't want to just go straight black, so I'm going to start with Payne's Gray. And that way, hopefully, we'll get some color depth and just make it a little more interesting. Although Payne's Gray isn't really much of a color, I, should have heard, I probably should have gone with Indigo. And that would actually be more in line with Ink Drops color palette. Actually, for the cup, I am going to go with Indigo. Indigo mixed with a brighter blue like marine blue and just kind of leave it at that All right, I am ready to start working on the hair again. So it's been a little minute since the last time I did, so I need to reactivate those pans. And my hat pans look pretty gnarly, y'all. Especially my sepia just looks terrible. Which is fine, paints aren't in like a beauty contest. It's fine if your paints look gnarly. They're meant to be used after all, they're tools. But they're also like full of cat hair, which is really gross. So I have some sepia here. Then I'm gonna let that dry and actually I think this brush will be a decent small enough brush to do her eyelashes, but I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna do her eyelashes. I was holding my breath the whole time, y'all. The eyes, especially eyelashes, it tends to be something that for me can really make or break how successful what I'm doing is. And it's so hard and it's so finicky to do it right. So it's one of those things where I just kind of like hold my breath and do the best I can. But I think those turned out really good. She's looking super cute. And one of our members just showed me the promo graphic they did for the draw pile we have planned. And it looks so cute. It is super good. So I'm also really, really excited about that. I can't wait to see everybody's art for this. 
Like it's really nice when Inkdrop does things kind of collaboratively or we all contribute something because it's a really nice reminder of just how skilled and talented everybody in the group is. And it's also just so nice to like see other people's interpretations of things. I love I love like themed drawing sets if you guys don't obviously from like Inktober. But when I used to do anthology like organized anthologies, we would do themed anthologies around like monsters. And the rules were always really loose. It was kind of like however you want to do it. And I really enjoyed, I was the person who would often do like um, the copywriting. If people didn't submit copy to go with their illustration, I would write copy for them. And I really enjoyed just seeing how everybody interpreted the theme. So that's definitely one of my hopes with Inkdrop that we can do more of that kind of stuff. Because for me, I just, that's what I like seeing. That's the kind of stuff I'm really into. And um, there's something really like fulfilling about seeing everybody work along a theme. Also, there's something like just really satisfying to me about that. So I'm really excited to see what other people make as like their anniversary promo images. We want to see their characters interacting in the Ink Drop Cafe or their version of the Ink Drop Cafe. And also for some reason, it's just like a really good reminder of how much I love all of the art produced by the members in our collective. Like everybody is super good. Sometimes it makes me feel like a real scrub. I know kind of objectively everybody's given it their all and really knocking it out of the park. And the fact that we have like members from around the world and people with different backgrounds and a variety of different stories and intentions for the kind of comics we want to make. It's just all really cool. And then we have some people who do comics full time and then some people who do comics um, because they enjoy it. And it's just like their interest. They don't, you know, like that's just really, all of that's really cool. And it's really cool that we're able to come together like this over something like comics, which are just awesome. And for me, community in comics has always been something I've really wanted and something um, I've always tried to foster in kind of my own way. So like to be able to be part of a comic community is really just nice. And like we can talk to each other every day or every other day. That's really awesome. Even though we live thousands of miles apart to hundreds of thousands to possibly a million miles apart, um, we can still communicate and collaborate. That's just such an incredibly powerful and cool thing. And I wish we all had more time to be able to just do that, you know? But we'll get there one day, I think. It's one of my personal goals is that we can do more collaborative things together, produce more. And I think other, I'm pretty positive other members, not every other member necessarily, I can't speak for everybody, but I think most of the other members want something similar at some point, sort of when the stars align a little bit better and we have more free time. really cool that we're going to get to celebrate a year anniversary together as a collective. And this was just a group that 
like I didn't know a lot of these people before this um a, a lot of it was like kind of cold contacting me or one of the other founders being like hey we're forming a comic collective do you want to join like these although we talk regularly now it's not like i went into this with like all my best friends you know this is kind of a collective that was born by force of will so i hope this is inspiring to some of you guys who are listening and watching that you can go and do this too and you don't even necessarily have to be super familiar with the people you want to be in a collective with you just need to figure out whether or not they're in a collective which some collectives have exclusive agreements ink drop does not um you could actually be theoretically in another collective and be an ink drop but all the other collectives have rules about being against being in multiple collectives so you know, just because we have that as like an option, it doesn't actually mean anybody can take us up on it. But should another collective ever decide they are okay with that, we would be happy to welcome in during one of our admissions periods, um, we'd be happy to welcome in people from other, other backgrounds. And you know, truth be told, there were time I figured we'd hit a, a year, um, but there were there was some growing times, and uh, I'm sure there are going to be growing times in the future because we do want to grow. And as groups grow, you know, you get new opinions, and sometimes those new opinions are dissenting. Um, so I could say this right now. I mean, I feel it at the moment in the future, but I'll probably feel it again afterwards. I kind of look forward to the challenges of growing and uh, introducing new members, welcoming in new members, enjoying new comics and having new experiences. Even if we sometimes butt heads and don't always agree, I'm looking forward to that um, because everybody has different backgrounds and they all have different things to offer and different things to bring to the table. So. You know, as long as we can disagree in a respectful way, I'm looking forward to having those conversations because it means I'm, I have the opportunity to learn something new and to see things from a new viewpoint. So, almost done. I thought I was going to be really leaning heavily on um, watercolor pencils, and I may use it to kind of lighten up. I'll move the camera, lighten up some of the table because the table still feels kind of dark. But um, otherwise, I think we're going to add white highlights and then mostly be done, which is really exciting because I've been working on this for three days. And you guys got to kind of experience a gamut of sick with me because <laughs> you guys were there for my recovery, which is kind of neat too. So I want to thank those of you who stuck it out through the whole thing. I know this was kind of long. Um, I appreciate that you did that. And I hope you guys will check out and drop cafe if you haven't yet. Um, and if you have, I hope you will come swing by our discord and say hi introduce yourself introduce your work and check out some of our really awesome chatters we have like a really nice little community around our collective as well which is incredible it's something i'm really grateful for because anytime you open up what you do to the public to random people you really run a lot of risks and i think it's something a lot of us have been kind of hesitant about and the fact that you know opening up the collective to other people to enjoy chatting and hanging out in our Discord was kind of a risk. And um, it hasn't always been comfortable, but it's brought about some really nice opportunities and I hope it can continue to bring some opportunities. Waxing kind of emotional. <laughs> um, all right, so this is almost done. I'm gonna let it dry clean some things up make some room 
And then I'm gonna pull out my opaque white and my white watercolor pencils and we'll start doing some of the final details. All right, so I'm gonna start using this white color pencil. This is a Derwent Intense. And like I said, really early on, I found the tabletop to be kind of dark. So what I like about Intense watercolor pencils or Derwent, Derwent Intense ink pencils, I guess, is that um, you do get a lot of intense color out of these and it can also be kind of blended out using water. So it, you can really vary how much, how intense the color you're putting down is. I word saladed the heck out of that. Basically for corrections, it's great because you can blend it out softly. Is where I was going, what I wanted to say. So it doesn't have to like just be like stark corrections, which is sometimes what you end up with, with some means of correcting. It's sort of all or nothing, you either correct your mistakes or you learn to live with them forever. Now the only problem with blending out intense with the white is that it blends out so much it's like you lose most of the effect. So you have to have kind of a light hand if that's what you're gonna do with it. However, with the colors, they're really saturated once you add water, so they're kind of the opposite. And it just takes some getting used to. They are my favorite watercolor pencils though, followed by Supercolor. Those are also really nice. With these, once you've added water to them, you're not gonna be able to rework them once they've dried. So they're kind of like India ink, in fact, some of them Maybe all of them are Indian ink. I don't know about the white, but they're like India ink in that up until it's dried, it's still reworkable. You can also do layers of it and sort of build up your corrections. So that's what I'm gonna do with this. Although the white already kind of light started lightening it up so moving in a good direction all right so i've kind of lightened up the background just a bit just going to go in and add And this is another one of my favorite steps since they're almost done. So that's pretty, pretty gratifying in and of itself. But also it's when, I don't know, it just seems to be kind of like the magic time. When all the magic starts to happen. Gonna add some highlight to the glass. And if it happens to be too intense or too thickly applied, you can always blend it out a little. So like on that strawberry over there, I can either use water or I can use a lighter shade, more watered down shade of the red. Just sort of clean up some of those edges, blend it out a little bit. All 
with Kara pages, I'll actually kind of abbreviate this step just because they're comic pages and you need to do a lot of them. So I can't spend forever fussing over individual panels. But with illustrations, I can definitely spend a little bit longer kind of finessing things, playing with things, kind of learning from the situation. So I'm going to move on in now to the opaque white. And this is Dr. P.H. Martin's Bleed Proof White. And like the Derwent, it can be blended out while it's still wet, but once it dries, it's much more permanent. But I find this and Copic's Opaque White to be great for adding kind of pops of white that's a highlight here and there. You can also use white gouache. So it's really about what's economical for you and what serves your need best. highlights in the eyes are really when the character starts to come to life. And even in cartoony styles, adding highlights to the eyes can really help add a lot of liveliness to the character. So I guess if someone were to ask what my favorite stages of a watercolor painting would be, it'd be the very beginning when we're sort of establishing things, blocking things in, because that has a lot of potential. And that's when I do sort of looser, more expressive work. And then towards the end, oh, I kind of want to get that area back here, because that should be darker. Do that in a moment. When I start doing all the things that tighten the illustration up, help it come together a little bit better and kind of breathe life into the characters I'm painting. Sometimes I'm less successful than others and that's always kind of disappointing when I drop the ball, but sometimes it's like magic. And I'm really glad I pushed through the ugly phase for this one. And you guys remember that. I had a lot of doubts. But I've been painting long enough that I also kind of know that if I just push, I just have patience and kind of take note of what's working and what doesn't work. Look at things with a critical eye. I can usually salvage what I'm doing. And sometimes even make something better than I'd expected. And I hope that's why I encourage you guys Oh, I'm going to pull out. You guys can't see what I'm doing. That's why I really encourage you guys to push through the ugly stage um, and be brave. Because not every painting is going to turn out the way you expect it will. But often, it'll turn out better than you kind of feared it was going. And often you can learn the most from kind of troubleshooting your own work. And it'll give you a skill set that'll be really useful in your other creative endeavors. And that's why one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons I've always made it a point to show my failures on this channel and not necessarily time lapse them out or edit them out, even if it makes me look 
bad or dumb or untalented or unskilled or whatever, any of the 10 million negative things that could make me look. Because it's more important to me that you guys see me fail and see how I can solve that problem than it is for me to save face over just one image. I want to soften some of that highlight on that leaf there because it's a little harsher than I wanted. To say this is also one of the reasons I really like working on Kilimanjaro is it can take a lot of paint, it can take a lot of working, and it does some really beautiful blending. You can also do a lot of lifting on this and it's a very, for the kind of paper it is, it's a cotton rag paper with, I love the tooth. Not everybody likes tooth, but I love the tooth on this paper. Um, it just really does an excellent job of sort of serving a variety of needs even for kind of a humble comic and kidlet illustrator like myself. You know, we're not usually top of any, uh, at least in this country, we're not really anybody's priority in terms of art supplies. So they'll take our money, but they don't really care to cater to us. But it's a paper that really, really serves my needs and I really like it. I don't hear people really talk about it as much as I feel like it kind of deserves. And I'm under no sponsorship from Cheap Joe's. Um, they don't even have them in Nashville to go all the way to Asheville just to see one. So I pretty much never hit them up or order from them online. So I'm not under any sponsorship or obligation. I just really like this paper and I just want to make it more accessible to you guys if you're interested in painting with a cotton rag paper. You know, Arches kind of stole the crown of the end all be all and Arches is great, but you know, Arches is expensive and uh, sometimes they have quality consistency issues. So I want to turn you guys on to an alternative that might be a little more in your price range. And that is well worth checking out and maybe adopting. Just going in with some sepia, trying to really get some color pop. All right, so I could probably play around with this and tweak things, adjust things for just about forever because that's just the, the way it is. Um, and I might make it better and I might make it worse, but I think I'm done. I think this is just about finished other than removing it from the board. So we had some notes earlier. I wanna go over those with you guys, see if we fulfilled those goals. And uh, I started taking those no notes in the middle of the ugly stage. So now's a really good time to kind of address those things. So feels dark, table is too dark. I judiciously used white color pencil. Can't solve everything, can't fix every problem, but I definitely lightened it up a bit more. It's not perfect, but it's better. Makes peace feel moody and downbeat. Well, it is still a little bit dark. Um, the camera is making it look a little lighter it could definitely utilize brighter colors. However, I did use nice, pretty warm colors in the background um, for the cakes to kind of help liven things up. I also have bright green leaves and a nice bright strawberry and a bright strawberry milkshake. And rather than opting for black on the cup and on the napkin, we went with a Payne's gray and with a really nice um, indigo slash marine blue. And plus Kara's, oh! we were going to do dots on her dress and that is definitely going to liven things up. So I'm going to start with the white color pencil and surface design has always been something 
like clothing pattern surface design. I always like it when other people do it. I like how it looks. I, I like, even when it's not done super successfully, I always appreciate the effort because it takes time to do it and it can go wrong. So it kind of opens you up, makes you vulnerable a little bit. And it's not necessary. You don't have to do it. I mean, you can do it to express form. You can do it to lighten something up. You can do it to add more visual interest in an area, but you don't have to do it. The piece was basically done. And then I opted to do this. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a nice bonus when I see other traditional illustrators doing it. Cause that's time. It's, sometimes it's a lot of time to do it. Um, for digital artists, I, I love seeing it, but the risks aren't quite the same because you know you can just delete that layer or you can redo that layer 30 times if you want to. There isn't as much of the sort of flying by the seat of your pants. So we're going with the color pencil first because it can be applied lighter. It can also be activated with water. Kind of smooth it out. So it's a little easier to control than a lot of the white additives. This is another thing, doing a surface design that usually works really well if you do it kind of at the end. Uh, just because applying a lot of glazes over a thickly applied detail would uh, end up being kind of muddy. And if you're careful enough, you can still get some of the shading from below to influence the design you're doing. All right, I'm gonna give that a chance to dry. It's a little bit mini mouse, but it does add um, just a little more playfulness and it's also a little reminiscent of the strawberry in the background. And this is still kind of wet, so it's not going to provide as much friction as the dry page will. So not really going to be able to apply, to apply as much color as I want and it'll end up just burnishing the paper surface. So I'm gonna switch over to the blue proof white and I'm gonna try to use it kind of thinly. Water it down a little bit more and apply it to some of the darker areas just to sort of fill in the scratchiness. And to be honest, I am not super duper hot on it, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let it dry and then I'm gonna use some of that shadow color from earlier just to kind of marry the two together because it's bleed proof white and once it's fully dry, it's much less likely to reactivate. All right, so now I'm just going to take a little bit, try to be really careful. You could just make it into a hot mess, but I'm taking a little bit of that shadow color that I mixed And I'm just kind of applying it over just to sort of give it a shaded look like it it's actually moving with the, the fabric. 
I think that helped a lot because they were all kind of the same tone, the same saturation almost. So this kind of knocked some back. just to kind of clean the back up a little bit. All right, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial and I hope it was helpful, useful and informative to you guys. I hope maybe you've learned some new tricks for watercolor. And if you haven't had not learned about Ink Drop Cafe, I hope you've learned lots about it and we'll head on over to our website as soon as this video is over or in your enthusiasm right now at inkdropcafe.com. You guys can find a link in the description below, but I hope you'll head over there and check out all of the fantastic comics and comic resources that we have available for people to enjoy, for people to read and for people to learn from. It was a pleasure painting with you guys and I'm glad I'm feeling better. I'm glad you guys got to witness a recovery and not a death. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys again with my next watercolor illustration or my next watercolor review or my next comic tutorial. I'm Becca Hilburn. I hope you guys have a great day and I hope you'll head on over there and read some fantastic comics. So have a great day guys. Bye. So that about sums up this watercolor tutorial. I hope you guys found it helpful, useful, informative, and enjoyable. And I hope you guys will take a minute to head on over to Ink Drop Cafe at inkdropcafe.com and check out all the phenomenal web comics that are free to read over there. While you're at it, if you're a comic artist or just a comic enthusiast interested in making comics, why don't you also check out the fantastic comic resources from things designed to help keep you updated and organized in your web comic journey to Photoshop brushes and uh, comic magazines. Ink Drop Cafe has definitely got you covered. And I want to wish my other members and affiliates a very happy one year anniversary. Congratulations, guys. We all worked really hard for this and let's spend a day and celebrate our accomplishment. I'm Becca Hilburn. I hope you guys found this video entertaining and I hope to see you guys again really soon. Bye guys.